Many of us delegate things, tasks, even accountabilities, but it doesn't really transfer until the person we've delegated it to takes on being fully accountable, takes on that ownership and responsibility. And not only that, but even when you've got somebody who's great at delegating such things, they're rarely really satisfied. Welcome to Sound Financial Bites, where we help you with bite-sized pieces of financial and life knowledge to help you design and build a good life. The knowledge that has been shared from stages at conferences, pages of national business magazines, and clients living across America, our host, Paul Adams, now brings directly to you. Hello and welcome to Sound Financial Bites. My name is Paul Adams. I'm excited that you could be with us today. And I'm excited for our guest today. Our guest is Carrie Granger. Carrie Granger teaches leadership worldwide, consults with executives and organizations on performance. And for those of you that have seen her on YouTube or read her blog, one of the things you'll know about her is she taught leadership at the Air Force Academy and has some really unique stories about things that she did in 2005 in Iraq, and she's going to tell us some of those things that she specifically did and how she helped inside of a culture that she walked into that was totally ineffective and turned it around in record time and literally set mission readiness records that the leadership even questioned into because they didn't think it was accurate. And there's some fun stories around that. Now, a little bit of embarrassment on my part. During the episode today, she... Her side recorded really well. Mine didn't. So you're going to notice a little bit of breakup on my side of the podcast. So for that, my apologies. But believe me, Carrie Granger's part of the podcast is far better. So if you notice any audio problems, don't worry. It's only the stuff I say and it's another stuff that she's saying. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Subscribe to the podcast. Be sure to write us a review. And we've got some unique white paper giveaways from Carrie. And you're going to be able to get those right at bombings, plural, bombings.sfgwa.com. That's bombings.sfg, like Sound Financial Group, wa.com. Enjoy this episode. Carrie Granger, I am so glad that you could join us today and be able to come and share your knowledge and experience here with our audience. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Now, I, I... you know, having gotten a chance to share with everybody a little bit about your unique background, about the things that you accomplished in 2005 in Iraq, how that turned into you being in a leadership role at one of the best leadership institutions by all measures, the Air Force Academy, and now turning that to your own business, all that. I, I would love to just have our listeners hear a little bit of the stories that I've heard from you in the past of like the visceral experience of first hitting the ground in a leadership role in Iraq in 2005? Mm, Sure. I actually showed up to Kuwait. And on the ground, we had a number of aircraft. They were old models, the same birds that we flew in the Vietnam era, no kidding. We had water bottles on fire hydrants on the ground all over the place. We had crew earbuds. I mean, it was just kind of grubby. Our tools were mediocre. We'd had them for a long time. The buildings we worked out of were the same buildings that were bombed out from the first Gulf War. So we had these aircraft shelters with big holes in the ceilings. Like literally, and, we're not talking like what we'd be used to in this country, like a hole that some rain would leak through. Like you're talking about like a mortar came through at some point. Exactly. And so what we did is we just built little trailers inside of these shelters, which was kind of reminiscent of the mindset in which we were operating there, which was, we're only going to be here for a few months or for a year. We can tolerate it until then. Tolerate what? Tolerate the cynicism, tolerate the poor equipment, tolerate the heat, tolerate all of it. And so nothing ever really got refurbished. Nothing ever really got fixed. Nothing ever really got built. You know, there's a whole acre next to these bombed out buildings that we never built a new building on until much later. And so 
this was a mindset and our stats were pretty low. You know, our requirement was 75% of our aircraft could fulfill on their mission at any time. And we were down around 58%. So when I got an opportunity to go to Iraq and I say it that way because it was life changing for me, all of a sudden Kuwait and Iraq are very different. You know, Kuwait is where the Marines go for R and R. <laughs> Iraq is where things are really happening. So when I arrived in Balad for the first time, and for the first time I started hearing the mortar attacks, and you know, many of the army and many of my fellow servicemen and women would hear those all the time. But for me, the first time that I heard that, I was terrified. I had my gear on, I had my helmet, I had my flak vest on, but I hit the floor and I just was terrified. And all of my training, my leadership education, my Air Force Academy commission, my master's degree in leadership, I knew that a leader should be courageous, but I didn't have access to being courageous until I dug way deep inside of myself and brought out the being of being courageous. And I'll tell you, I never learned that in a leadership book. I learned that in this small little study I had done about being and how do you authentically manifest something like courage when what's there for me is fear. And that changed everything for me. How long in to being, I, now I feel like I'm saying it wrong. I say Iraq, you say Iraq. I don't know if that's tomato, tomato. I'm sure a listener will send me an email and tell me. Uh, but how long after being on the ground did you like have that, that experience of crossing the threshold into holding your head up high and looking like the leader people thought you should be to crossing over to that being an authentic ex expression of you? Well, it, it actually happened in an instant. I was there for about four or five hours when the first mortar attack came. And I was on the ground. I was scared for my life. And the only thing that came to me was being courageous and my guys. And I don't mean to sound like an old war movie or something because it, it didn't play out that way. But when my focus shifted from myself and scared for my life to being who my being the person my airmen needed me to be so my focus went out to them and they were counting on me they were looking toward me i was called into being for them so it was in a way being committed outside of myself and in, it actually happened in an instant. It wasn't like a long reflection. It was a shift in an instant. And from there, we got our job done in Iraq. We went back to Kuwait and the whole thing shifted. And it wasn't just having been under attack, but rather that I actually saw the people that we served. So I saw the men and women that flew on our aircraft and I saw the needed supplies, and I found out that when our aircraft don't fly, when a particular version of our aircraft don't fly, people die. You know, we didn't have, they don't have the electronic jamming that they need, and there's other technological reasons. I actually found out that our pitiful mission capable rate of 58% made a big difference. And, and so when I went, Go ahead. And you're in that spot where now prior it was, it kind of doesn't matter. We'll be here a few more months anyway. Yeah. And then you sh began to shift. It sounds like you saw that shift for yourself, like holy mackerel. And and if I remember right, didn't you end up with a almost a mantra for everybody that came out of that? Yeah. Something like when we don't fly, people die. Yeah. And <laughs> I, yeah. And, and it's real. No, it's real. And that's the whole point, actually, is it wasn't even in the moment that I got the difference between knowing about courage and being courageous. 
what shifted for me as a leader was when I actually got that it matters and that this isn't just this isn't just we have to get our aircraft out. But when I was there in Iraq and I saw, okay, I went through a mortar attack maybe six times, but the people who are there day in and day out who count on our birds delivering people and resources, supplies, they go through mortar attacks and worse 10 times a day over 12 months. And when we don't fly, people actually do die. So all of us, all of a sudden, a mediocre screwdriver was no longer acceptable. All of a sudden, a trailer inside of an aircraft shelter that had been bombed out was no longer acceptable. And within a few months, we had five and a half million dollars worth of new tools and equipment. We had a completely new building with, by the way, the first plumbing. And you know, we just actually took care of the guys taking care of the aircraft. And the whole thing happened in an instant when two, well, really two things. I got the difference between knowing and being, which launched my entire career around leadership. And I got context. I got what it was for. I got that putting up with something for five, six months was an insufficient context to lead in that environment. And that when we don't fly, people die. And when I began to operate consistent with that and the other people I worked with and led and were led by, I operated consistent with that. We turned around our numbers in, in just a couple months and sustained that for a number of rotations. Now, uh, the thing that jumps out at me first, sorry, is it like the other focused component? Like there's a little, like there's a certain amount of personal will we can bring to the table to hold our head up high and despite being scared as all get out, you know, try to keep our knees from knocking together and be in action. But there's two types of others focus that I'm, I'm noticing and I, is that you were focused on your folks, which allowed you in that initial moment of like, I've got a bunch of people I need to care for who are depending on me having to sh show up and act a certain way. And I need to have the shift in my being around leadership for them. That's the first thing I heard that was other focused. And then the other thing I heard was that you, the same thing is what had the bombed out buildings and the insufficient tools and the mission capable rating of 58% be unacceptable. Also others focused, I'm, can I take a wild guess that what caused the shift for everybody else that you went to 100% mission capable in three months, was it because they had a different relatedness to others in, in their own roles or like what, how did you do that? Yeah, very good. I don't know if it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of why I don't like this story. I like this story a lot, <laughs> but part of what I don't like about this story is what I've learned since as an executive coach in the commercial domain. And, uh, and what I don't like about this story is it puts too much emphasis on the leader. And it's a, it's a story that came about a little over 10 years ago when I was beginning my leadership development career. And people like that story. So they ask about it a lot. And it's true. I produced phenomenal results as a leader. And that gives me great credibility, especially as a military leader in the civilian sector it gives me credibility. What I don't like about it is there's way too much emphasis on the leader as a hero. And it's it's not right, actually. It's not how things actually work. Leadership has and leaders have an enormous impact on the result. But when we think about leaders and we think about leadership development, we often put way too much focus on individual commitment and willpower and leader action alone. So there's never a self only invention. There's only ever co invention. So when I came back to my unit in Kuwait, I could never have done this on my own. I did start to have conversations and in the conversations with some of my most trusted non-commissioned officers, those senior NCOs that we rely on so much in the military. 
they kind of knew that, right? And so all I had to do is say, hey, Sergeant Smith, this is what I realized. And I've been such a fool as a leader allowing the toleration of this. And I can't imagine, I can't imagine anymore stepping over some of these mediocre things, attitudes, actions, tools, equipment, performance. And in our converse, the conversations, we began to invent a new future together. We began to invent a new kind of unit together. And it didn't happen because I said, hey guys, here's a new vision, follow me. It happened because the conversations in our unit shifted. So what did I have to do with that? I came back and yes, as a leader, my conversations matter. And I do get a platform to speak from, especially if I have integrity with my word and a certain level of respect. So yes, my conversations matter, but who I have them with, what I say, and how often I say it, and then what they do with it. So as my senior NCO started speaking to the NCOs and the NCOs start speaking to the airmen and we all shift the way we speak about what we're doing, our roles, what we can go after, what's possible, what's not possible, different opportunities start to arise. So it wasn't like my imagination as a leader envisioned, but rather that we co-invented what was possible through our conversation. And that has a lot to do with culture. So many people think about culture as this amorphous thing that we can't get our hands on. Well, culture, where does culture happen? Culture happens in the conversations between the members of the organization. Culture happens at the water cooler. Culture happens in the break room. Culture happens after the meeting, you know, the conversations that happen after the meeting. And yeah, conversations happen in the meeting. And so the conversations that we had allowed ourselves to fall into and the associated mood of resignation and cynicism, you know, we can put up with that. I can't believe it's like this. These are terrible conditions. Can't wait till I go, can go home. You know, the chow hall is gross. Oh, did you see they got a new pizza shop? I mean, those were the kinds of conversations that we had allowed to make up our culture. And inside of those conversations, not much was possible. All that was possible was to basically tolerate and survive our time there. Well, so, go ahead. It would be like, uh, to put it in a different context, would be the difference between a leader goading people on to get them to get what's done that they're supposed to get done, which looks like, uh, you know, incentivizing them, manipulating them, making it compulsory for people to do certain things versus what I'm hearing you having done is like you thought through how can my conversations not get it all done, but how do they become catalytic to allow other people to step in? Like yes. Yeah. And in retro, you're giving me more credit to have seen that at the time, <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's exactly what happened is first of all, I worked on myself, you know, and how was I, how was I, reinforcing the kind of culture that was happening. I did do that. And I did start to speak differently. And I did encourage my senior NCOs to speak differently. That all happened. And in, in those catalytic conversations, our entire culture shifted. And in that shifted culture, new horizons of possibility emerged. So something like, oh, there's a whole acre sitting next to this bombed out shelter. Why don't we build a building there? That showed up as possible, which seems so obvious in retrospect. But given the kinds of conversations we were having prior, it didn't even show up like a viable opportunity. Speaking it didn't even show up at all. That viable opportunity or the level of performance people see as possible Share with our audience what happened with the control tower after you got to 100% mission capable. Oh yeah, that was really good. So our control tower, uh, our control tower called me on the radio and said, 
Lieutenant Granger, we need you to come in and report your aircraft status because there is something wrong with our computers. It's reporting that you're a hundred percent fully mission capable. And that was so far out of what was possible for them. That was so far out of reality, what reality had been, that they thought there was something wrong. And of course, I very proudly stated on the radio, the computers are working. <laughs> Everybody can hear the computers are working just fine, control tower. Uh, it is 100%. And, yeah. That, and, yeah. And I think when, when you're talking about that in the conversations of people's existing mindsets, they don't see it as possible. And there's so much in the positive psychology movement that only deals with how we look at things as individuals and yeah. being able to be more effective, as you put it, stronger willpower, determination. And not surprisingly to my audience, I'm going to tie it back to the way people look at their money and wealth. But I cannot tell you how often I watch the very, you know, it's a very micro culture, but between two spouses and giving them a new way to think about or new, literally new terminology, new distinctions of how to talk about money and their relationships can heal with each other. Mm. They will have, they'll feel more connected about the future that they're creating because now they're creating the same future in the same strategy. And it never occurred to me until you and I getting a chance to reconnect and catch up that I like, we are actually helping our clients have new language and have their own catalytic conversations where it's not because I as the advisor or one of our other advisors is doing something really amazing. We're becoming catalytic for everything that happens between the meetings. That's yes. Yeah, you shifted the conversation. And not only that, but you've also shifted the mood. And moods are deeply connected with the assessments that we have about our lives. And so there could be a mood of resignation, especially in the finance domain, or a mood of apathy, or a mood of hopelessness, or even a mood of over optimism. I don't know. Yeah. But Go ahead. Over optimism it definitely gets people, and the that mood, which I I love the way Fernando Flores. For any of our listeners that have read his stuff, uh, he used to tell me that a mood is an automatic assessment, usually about the future, that could be grounded or ungrounded. Like it might be, exactly. it just might be the right time to be happy about your finances, but it might not be, or it might be the right time to be okay with the way things are at this Air Force facility overseas in a unforgiving desert environment, or it's, uh, uh, or it's a great place to feel, you shouldn't feel resigned about it. You should be taking some action. Uh, if, if one thing that I, I think about in the way we named this episode with the idea of bombings, leadership, and cultural capability, one thing that I thought was so interesting about your time specifically in Iraq that is stands out that that I think happens in every business culture environment. It certainly happens with people's money, but it's super evident in the desert, specifically with aircraft, is that the environment is constantly breaking down what would have worked. Well, the environment is literally going to make it so that it doesn't work. And I think that's true for our organizations, especially in this idea of that cult, those cultural conversations that are happening, there's outside influences constantly wearing them down. It's easier to see on a turbine engine, turbine, I said that wrong, I'm sure, but it's easier to see on an engine than it is on a culture. But can you talk about where you've observed that inside of companies and relationships? Yeah, a couple of things. When you talk about the environment, I think both the cultural environment, internal environment, and also external environment, and before we started this podcast, you and I had a brief chance to talk. And one of the things that I'm interested in now is what I got wrong about leadership development in the first decade of, of doing so. Maybe it's the second decade, first two decades of doing so. And one of the things that I got wrong is, again, this overemphasis on the leader, him or herself. 
And what we often miss is the capacity to read and effectively navigate the different forces at play, the economic forces, the political forces, the social forces, the technological forces, and how many of us, well, not all of us, but a good number of us, if we aren't, if we don't like it, or we have a strong opinion about it, or it just seems like there's too much coming at us, we don't pay attention. And then we get completely blindsided by the environment that actually is shaping us. And that's another reason why strategic plans don't really work. Because you can't plan. There is no prediction. Life is full of these strange occurrences. You meet somebody and your whole future alters. You know, some big accident happens and everything changes. So the best you can do is to prepare yourself, strategically prepare yourself, strategic preparation, to learn to read and navigate and and to recognize emerging trends in these different spheres that impact your industry, that impact your business. I work a lot in healthcare. And if you're not paying attention to all the different policies and regulations and political and social and economic forces at play, you're going to find yourself really blindsided. So externally, what I got wrong about leadership development is to focus on empowering the leader, which is, that's right, you ought to do that. But what I'm now into is really learning how to read the world, you know, and everybody ought to be reading the world every day and having really good sources for that. The other thing, when you talked about the environment is thinking internal environment and man, people undervalue culture. So many people think that culture is this luxury thing, soft thing that we can attend to once we get our performance or other things in order. And I can't tell you how wrong that is. And what I've seen is that the culture can completely undermine everything you're doing and the culture can empower and the culture can equip you to deal with really tough conditions if it's right. So the culture can overcome or undermine. And we don't pay attention to the internal environment, the internal space that allows for us to have our biggest accomplishments. So we don't pay, we don't pay attention that each and every conversation matters. You know, whether or not people feel valued, that actually really matters as to how much you're getting out of people and how much they're putting in and how fulfilled they are and whether or not they see a future for themselves. You know, do you have an accountable kind of culture? You know, are people accountable? Do you have the kind of culture where you can hold each other accountable and not get defensive? You know, the kind of culture that learns, that's interested in learning and developing themselves. So there's so much that we undervalue when it comes to culture and as if that's something to get to when we have time. Yes. And uh, there's two things you said there that just landed right, right on me, Carrie. And one is you're talking about conversations and we, we did a podcast. It's episode 46. If folks want to go back and listen to it, it's uh, the idea of conversation is a currency of leadership. And it is, it is the transaction that leaders are in and a part of every day is being in the conversations. And then the, the other part that jumped out at me was Carrie, you mentioning about there's no, the strategic plans don't work, which is, uh, so, I mean, I mean this in a very loving way to people that help, uh, who maybe are listeners to podcasts who build strategic plans for their companies or other people's companies. But, uh, I'll share with you how, and, and having built some myself, how I relate it to like someone's financial plan. Uh, and it's because, uh, and I mean this in a, in a real straight way is that financial plans don't turn out the way people plan them. All we can do is select a future state, maybe much like an aircraft taking off in Baghdad and landing in whatever city. What was the city you were in when you got off the aircraft and your bombing started immediately? Balan. So take off one city, fly to another city. That aircraft is actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
it's actually off course 99% of the time, meaning the direct line of travel it's not taking because it's having to deal with air traffic, storms, winds, and uh, Coriolis. Oh, yeah. All that stuff is acting on the aircraft. So all it can do is select the future state. I want to land over here. And it's probably only on course that last like five miles coming into land. And other than that, it's off course, but always arriving at the future state intended is that's how I relate to what you said. Would that be a way people could hold that in their business cultures? Yeah, I, I love what you said. And by the way, I get asked to do strategic plan uh, support. And I, you know, I call it strategic alignment because I'm uncomfortable with plans because exactly, you know, life happens and it never happens the way you predict. But I love what you said, because that's right. Selecting a future state and coming from that future state, acting consistent with that future state. And I'm not saying you don't strategically look and think and say, okay, if between there and here, what are the big lines of effort that we need to be focused on and where do we want to place our bets and all of that, all of that's great. And what I'm pointing to is that you really can't predict. You just can't predict. And if we're, if we think that we're going to succeed through predicting, uh, uh, controlling and, empowering ourselves it's just it's just not the way that it works well, yeah it's a great concept <laughs> the idea of because I'll, I'll never forget when i uh you know took my first real big solo flight uh it was in southern california flying over the mountains i was supposed to land at a place called bracket airfield which was a, a big airfield in world war ii uh, and now it looks kind of like Iraq. It's sort of bombed out with like a few in a place called. Right. And uh, in any case, flying over there, uh, I got shaken. And I mean shaken, not like physically or mentally, like actually shaken coming down from altitude in this little Cessna. And I found myself like, I'm not positive I didn't get turned around in flight here. And so I took out a GPS I had as backup put in what I thought was the right, uh, the right coordinates. It turns out I put it in for this, uh, little radio beacon, uh, called an AWOS that's sitting on the floor of the desert that had a very similar call number to bracket airfield. And I flew around the desert for about 20 minutes and couldn't find the airport. Mm. And I had enough fuel. I could have either flown to Las Vegas cause I could follow the highway or I could follow the highway back to where I came from. But what was so interesting when it came to the flight plan and flight control communicating with me is they knew there were parameters in which I should be operating, meaning I, I shouldn't go into that uh, military airspace on the other side of the mountains where they train the predator drones. That's a bad idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're watching me on radar for that. But as long as I was just tooling around, not making too much mess of anybody, I could, nobody was getting on me. But when I went over my flight window, my phone rang and it was happening just as I finally found the airfield and landed. But I think about that in this strategic planning is that all we can do is set the future state. We work toward it, whether this is, you know, trying to plan for the future with your finances or it's trying to pick a future objective for you and your team, because we need the team to think about the future state also and that they're organizing to try to help us arrive there also with us trying to be catalytic around what are the parameters in which you can get that accomplished in. And, and now I'm sorry, I'm going like almost right to another question with you, Carrie, but talk, talk a little bit about the difference between asking somebody to get something done toward that plan or objective or future state and delegating a task and what's going wrong there from, for many executives. Yeah, I, and I, I'm following the bridges you're making, which is really great. Goodness, I hope our listeners are. <laughs> yeah, it, well, I like, I like what you're doing because we're at the very high conceptual level and you just brought it down to a very practical thing, which is something I hear a lot from my clients. I just can't seem to 
get my people to take ownership and responsibility. See, they don't get on the call and say, Carrie, can you help me delegate? Because they don't see that as the issue. They delegate tasks all day long. The issue they come to is how do I get my team to take responsibility and ownership? Now, I hear that as as effective or ineffective delegation. Here's why. Many of us delegate things, tasks, even accountabilities, but it doesn't really transfer until our, the person we've delegated it to, takes on being fully accountable, takes on that ownership and responsibility. And not only that, but even when you've got somebody who's great at delegating such things, they're rarely really satisfied. And the problem is that we're delegating actions. The focus is on, please take on this action or this domain. But what we fail to do is to work on having the people that we're giving actions to see what we see. So we've got to back up a step and work on the way that our people are seeing the situation or seeing the future or seeing the challenge or seeing the people. So what I end up doing with my clients is having them work with the people that they're quote delegating to so that those people see what they see. They see the outcome. They see the commitment. They see the possible breakdowns and challenges. They see with the same criteria and standard for assessing success or failure. So when you work on the way in which they're observing the whole thing, then when you give an action, you can pretty well trust that they're going to take action in a successful manner. The same thing happens when you create a future state. So if you see the future state, but the people you're working with have no commitment to that personal commitment to that future state. In other words, it, they don't own it. It doesn't fulfill on something that's of fundamental concern to them. It doesn't live for them as compelling. They don't see their own personal contribution to that future state. Then when you give them an action, it doesn't live for them in the same way it lives for you. So the first thing, thing to do is to align on, and that's why I like to call it strategic alignment, is to align on what's that future we're creating together. And that we align on that co-invention, that we have a shared context, a shared future, and then to begin to transfer the way of seeing to them. And delegation almost becomes a non a non thing because the actions become so obvious to take in fulfillment of that future. Was that English? That was great. And what I'm thinking about for our listeners is they hear that and you know everybody's listening they're either, you know, washing dishes right now, they're out on a run, they're at the gym, they're driving to work or they're sitting at their desk just kind of letting some of this wash over them. If they're listening to that right now is I want to I want to give them what I, you know me well enough to know. I don't like tips and tricks about business. I like the super deep mm. stuff. Mm-hmm. So we're going to leave this with a tip of something they could do differently in the next action they're in at the office as a leader. Could they like just be able to say, hey, would you take care of this for me? And I want to just take another moment with you. I want to just communicate with you something I don't always do, but I'd love to start communicating why all of these things. Like, would that be like a baby step somebody could take toward the much more fundamental direction you're pointing people? Yeah, I think that's a baby step. It's a baby step. uh, And the reason I say that's a baby step is that's a good thing to do. And that will provide uh, some context. Now, the next step would be, does the why matter to that person? Mm. And is that person committed to the why? Do they care about the why? Yes. And then the I, next step is, can I say one more step? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just I, like, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit because I like, uh, it's, it's just brilliant. Thank you. The next step after that is, do they see breakdowns on the way to the why? And do they assess the why in the same criteria you assess the why? So now I'm going down the road a little bit. So to bring it back to the baby step is the why 
and do they care about the why? And if they don't, have a conversation so that you can align on that. Well, number one, you are changing the agenda that we're going to hold at uh, Sound Financial Group's, uh, you know, like one day quarterly session that we have that closes out at the end of each quarter. Uh, and we do that four times a year before the annual planning session. But the idea that everybody in my firm could agree on the future state, which I, th I align, yeah. align, not agree. Ah, thank you. Align on a future state and then be able to think for themselves. What is, and this is like, I think this is such a cool gift for people to have for folks on their team is that they can begin to act autonomously to prepare themselves strategically, strategic preparation of themselves for their own role. And what the future looks like. Because right now, what most people do is they go take the next class or master's course or whatever it seems like the thing is to do based upon the environment, rather than being able to autonomously say like, hey, what do you guys think about paying me to go to this conference so I learn these things which will help us with that future state we all built alignment around. Totally. Yeah, that's good. That's amazing. Uh, now, on the financial front, what I see there is that for people being able to understand and agree on the future state that they want to create as a... A line. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The future state mm -hmm. they want to align on. Mm-hmm so that they are both traveling the same direction or better yet, just being clear about what the future state is they've both been after or that one of them has been after a future state for the future with their money and the other one hasn't been. They've been in actions that are going to have a future state, but ha but it wasn't distinguished. I think that happens with people's health. You know, like people don't have a, here's what I'd like my physical body to be like at age 65. They have no, for themselves, no personal distinction of, I want to weigh this much and be able to be this much physically active at age 65. And it's no wonder people are falling apart when they get older because they've never even said what they would want. That's amazing. And that, and that is something that as human beings, I'm sure that you've talked about this on one of your podcasts somewhere, but just the power of articulating and creating is something that we have that no one, no other animal has. You know, our our pets can make requests, but our pets cannot declare a future. <laughs> I like. And, uh, and what happens when we declare? We begin to act consistent with that. Um, is, is quite powerful. Yeah. My, I've got one more question mm -hmm. I want to ask you that I'm sure we're going to spend a few minutes on. That uh, could be a little bit controversial. Mm. I don't mean it to be, uh, but mm -hmm. much like many things I do, I had a speaking engagement this morning to a group down in Tacoma, and where I start was, uh, let me apologize for offending everybody, because this is probably going to be so I am sorry. Good place to start. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, so this is both for you, Carrie, in case it offends you, and definitely for my audience. I am so sorry for what I said just now. So just play that back if you need to go back to it. And uh, accept my sincere apologies if this bothers you. So, Carrie, I grew up in a household where my mom was a primary breadwinner and my dad stayed home. And that was way before that was like at all cool. To yeah. do. Uh, and it it it's really set us apart as a family. And uh, my mom and I, my dad and I have this wonderful fam familiar relationships. We're going on a month long trip with my parents and my family here in uh, August, taking the RV to Wyoming and bumping around Wyoming. So it, it, it was a tight family growing up, me being an only child. And I got a chance to hear some of my mom's, I would say difficulties. They weren't struggles because she didn't make them struggles about being a woman in a male dominated government agency. Uh, she was with the Department of Energy for years and rose to some of the top levels of leadership in that organization before retiring. But it was 38 years. And you have lived and worked in some incredibly male-dominated environments. Uh, you know, of course, in the in the military and now in the corporate world, in the private sector. 
that uh, I don't know, but I imagine it's not a one to one ratio at the Air Force Academy, men and women. So no. what's that been? What's that been like for you? And and just before I, I turn you loose on that, I, I want to offer one thing that I noticed my mom never did is there are a lot of people out there, especially now in the world of social media that are like the best way I might describe when I see them is like grievance peddlers, meaning there are people who are really out there and after people being able to have a problem with the way the environment's treating them uh, rather than enabling those people to take some kind of different action or a uh, different set of conversations or different mindsets to affect the environment. Like they, they, the grievance peddlers have a real deep interest in having people get resigned so that the, they can trust the person that's very loudly in the upset to take action. Uh, and so how, how did you, because I, I think having gotten to know you, I don't think you were laying victim to any of that as it happened. So how, how did you deal with it, navigate it as a uh, incredibly accomplished person in environments that were heavily male dominated. Okay. That's it. That's the whole question. Okay. I have three different ways I want to answer it. So I'll start or at least respond to you. So I'll start with one, uh, just to pick this off the grievance peddlers. That's an interesting term. I recently wrote an article on how to deal with the victim mentality in others. And I'd love it if we could provide that for your listeners. And only because it has two things that I think are really important in working with that mentality. And this is not about me, but just because you made me think of it. One is that you've got to be able to validate the perspective and to see that if you saw life the same way they, they did, you'd act in the same way. And a way of working with them is actually to accept their mentality, understand their mentality, and then work to get their their commitment. But there's a whole, I don't know, 10 minute article on that, that I'd love to make available for your listeners. That'd be, that'd be great. Uh, and yep. for our listeners, uh, I'm going to give you guys the URL here in a few minutes, but Carrie's made several of her white papers available to us so that we can get those in a request. Uh, you give us your email, we will drop all those in your email box in no time flat. Yeah, great. Uh, the other thing, the second thing that I want to say briefly before I really answer this for myself is there's really two sides to this. And I think I've always, yes, when you are in a male dominated environment and just growing up in the United States, our notions of leadership have been pretty masculine. And there's some really great things about that. And so, and yet they also really influence us. So that's something to keep in mind. And being in a male dominated place, there are sometimes things don't work out quite as well, but it's a double-edged sword and you got to see the other side of that. And that as a woman, if you really do succeed or you do something really great, you get the same amount of attention just in the positive side. And so I think I've always embraced that there is a double edged sword and it's not all one way. It actually goes both ways. And so if, if you can embrace both sides of it, you can take the bad with the good. Okay. That's, that's one thing. Um, you know, I, I, yes, I've been unfairly treated, but I've also been in some ways recognized even more than my peers because of my gender. Mm. So I got to be able to embrace both sides of that coin or sword, whatever you want to say. Okay. But here's the real thing I want to say. It's not so much about being a woman for me that I found difficult or challenging or something to work through. It was more about being a mother. And I didn't really, I did face some discrimination previously, but when I became a mother, that's when I really began to feel the limitation put on me. Like if you're a mother, you can't possibly be able to continue to do this level of performance with your job or because I'm decide to pick up my child and drop her off at her preschool, my hours are limited. And 
you know, if I use that as a way of describing what I'm doing in my day, I found that to be not necessarily accepted unless you're working with another woman of similar ages or even a male, really. It's not about the gender, more about the being a parent. And so I really had to work through for myself, who am I going to be as a mother with a strong voice in the world? Yeah. What is it going to take to be a mother with a voice in the world, with a strong contribution? That's what I mean by voice, with a strong contribution to make in the world. And what is that going to be like? One of you brought up Dr. Fernando Flores earlier, and I study with him and learn from him, and 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 he's been a great teacher for me. One of the things that I've also learned from him is that we're never really free from the history that shapes us. And if we think about when we grew up, male, female, I don't care who you are, really. Uh, different ethnicities, different cultures, different times and different eras. For me, I grew up in the United States. I'm Generation X. And there was a certain soup that I grew up in. And part of that soup is what it is to be a successful professional, what it is to be a successful woman, what it is to be a successful mother. And we can get gripped by these assessments that we actually inherited by virtue of being born in this time, in this era, in the country that we're born into, in the region, in the ethnicity, in the nationality. And so I found myself pretty gripped by those implicit expectations. And until I could see them, and I could see that success meant a certain ladder to climb into, or a certain financial success, or a certain fame, or something like that or a certain productivity and being a mother meant this and that. And I I started to see all these expectations that I put on myself and how I wasn't measuring up to all of them all the time. And I declined those expectations. I actually declined to be gripped by them and began to create the success and fulfillment and what being a mother with a contribution to make in the world would look for me and began to design my life consistent with that and act consistent with that. And I have to tell you, I work half the time I used to work. I work, I make three times what I used to make and I'm more fulfilled than ever. Now, do those, do those expectations come up from time to time? They do. And I have to recognize them as something that I'm not choosing, that I didn't author, but rather inherited. And I'll tell you, a lot of my clients, we look at this, a lot of my clients, we look at this. And a lot of my women clients, between somewhere between 35 and 60, we look at this. And, you know, under 35 or over 60, they're gripped by different kinds of conversations. That's, you know, rough, right? plus or minus 10, 15 years or, but because we are gripped by different conversations and different moods, given when we grew up in the soup that we grew up inside of. Is that responsive? Yeah, I, mm-hmm. it's wonderful. And I think what it can give everybody for context is that idea that nearly everybody has gone through some kind of difficulty. Maybe there's the rare listener on our podcast where the toughest thing they've ever gone through was when they were a child going through their mom's purse. But for everybody else, (laughs) they've had some difficult times and, and it's, and people can be mistreated or, or make certain assumptions about you. And I love that idea of being able to kind of just treat it like you would the sand in the desert and the damage it does to equipment is that is there. And now I'm going to decline it or I'm going to accept it and work around it. But either way, it's going to lead to some action. for me to be able to be in rather than sit here and wait for somebody else to fix it. Yeah. I'm sorry to say on top, to say something else on top of what you just said, but you just said, accept it. And that's really the key is you can't decline until you accept. Ooh. Oh, well, I think one, this has been phenomenal. You've definitely changed for sound financial group. What our next quarterly uh, retreat is going to be like for us to be able to take time and reflect and think differently about strategic preparation, et cetera. I think we may need to have 
an entire podcast having you back later this year. Uh, Carrie's working on some great things that she shared with me that we need to keep close to the vest right now, but we're going to have her back and let her share that with everybody later this year. But just that idea of you need to accept before you decline could be an entire podcast by itself. So Carrie, I'm so <laughs> grateful good. you could be here and and share this with our audience today. And the difference that you've made for me in my life has been tremendous. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention to you, because my wife also has gotten some training and teaching directly from Carrie. And uh, in, in her time where Carrie was speaking at a very large conference that uh, my wife went to in Dubai, of all places, with 350 other people from all over the world. And uh, you've had an incredible impact on both of our lives. And I'm just so thankful to you, Carrie. Mm, I am very grateful for you. And thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your listeners with me. You're welcome. And, and for all our listeners, uh, I mentioned that I would give you guys all the URL of where you can get this great stuff and we'll drop it into your email box. It's bombing, bombing.sfgwa.com. That's referring to, just for the record, bombing, like bombing a location given Carrie's Air Force background, not bombing like she didn't do awesome on this podcast or that I didn't do awesome for that matter. Uh, <laughs> bombing SFG wa.com and we look forward to being able to get that out to you carrie we so look forward to having you back and i hope all of you listening today have gotten as much value out of this as i did being in the conversation with carrie and don't hesitate just write in share with us where you've seen some insights we love hearing what you guys get out of the podcast you can email me directly at info at sfgwa.com. Our team gets all of those emails in front of me to be able to review, and we love being able to share them with our guests. So I hope everybody has a great rest of your day, and we just hope this was a contribution to help you design and build a good life. I want to acknowledge you for taking the time to tune in to Sound Financial Bites. You stopped long enough in your busy day to reflect on your finances and your future to help you design and build a good life. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you have a topic you would like to hear us discuss, please send us a note on Facebook, LinkedIn, soundfinancialbites.com, or email us at info at sfgwa.com. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to any resources that were covered in each episode. For our full disclosure, please check the description of this episode, the description of this podcast series, or you can visit our website. Make it a great day.